Chapter 18 Cleanup Crew There's no way of measuring exactly how long the slaughter took, except that Chopper Repulso was likely killed a little before midnight and the darkness hadn't lifted when the final shot was fired into the school of Goldberg Flans. Sunrise on Saturday, April 8, 2006 came at 5.55 a.m. and it was wet and chilly as the crew of killers looked to dispose the limp bodies of their one-time biker brothers. The killer's first plan was to drive the eight victims about an hour east down Highway 401 and dump them near the twin cities of Kitchener and Waterloo. Frank Mather and Bull Gardner couldn't close the hatch because Big Paul Sanapoli's massive body was in the way. Even by joining forces, they couldn't shove him in, so Mather used his feet to push. Big Paul still wasn't all the way in, but it would have to do. The sun was starting to come up and Kellestine was looking frantic. The cover of darkness had almost lifted. Come on, Kellestine urged. Come on, guys. Gotta get going. Gotta get going. Then Mather noticed that the Infinity was almost out of gas. He produced a jerry can from the garage, but then noticed it contained oil, not gasoline. Kellestine sent him back to get the right can, but ordered him not to use it at all, because they would need the rest for other things. Finally, they were ready to leave, and Kellestine unlocked the chain that had sealed the inner fence shut. Frank Mather would lead the way, with Big Paul perilously close to falling out of the hatchback. Behind the wheel of Pony Jet's own Chevrolet Silverado tow truck, MH followed, with Pony in the back seat wearing a black jacket, blue jeans, and cowboy boots. Someone had placed a red and blue plaid jacket over Pony's face so they wouldn't have to look at their brother in death. The Silverado hauled Chopper Raposo Silver Volkswagen Golf. Crash's body was slumped behind the steering wheel, blood hardening around a bullet wound behind his left ear. Blood was also caked on his face, and more of it was coming out of his nostrils. A green fleece shirt had been placed over his body, as if it could somehow comfort him. Besides, his body was boxers, listing to his left as if resting against his old friend. Chopper lay in the back hatch area, wrapped in a multicolored carpet, curled in a fetal position, his eyes still open and registering what might be interpreted as shock. Dwight Mushy drove Trotter's Pontiac Grand Prix with Arvina beside him and the body of Gold Flans slumped in the back. The Trotters had been driving the car for only three weeks, but already the back seat was cluttered with exactly the sort of things that accumulate in young families' cars. Plastic children's toys, two backpacks, a car seat, games, and tissue. There was also a letter from the Halton and District Catholic School Board and their veterinarian. Now, Flans' body stained with the children's toys next to him. Someone had pulled a black nylon jacket over his head. Bringing up the rear of the convoy, Taz Sandham drove alone in his red blazer. Wiener Kellestine remained back at the barn plotting the next move. The early morning procession of vehicles emerging from 32196 Aberdeen Line was witnessed by several residents who were beginning farming chores or heading off to work. It was hard to miss as the tow truck had its amber lights flashing. The plan of driving to the Kitchener-Waterloo area was scuttled when Frank Mather noticed that the gas gauge on Goldberg Flan's sports utility vehicle was still almost empty. They hadn't put in nearly enough gas. It clearly wouldn't be a smart idea to drive the Infinity up to a service station with the bodies of three murdered bikers in plain view inside. And running out of gas by the side of the road was even less appealing. Going back to the Kellestine farm with the bodies for more gas wasn't much of an option either. So Mather made an executive decision. He pulled off a Highway 401 about 10 minutes west at Union Road, and the rest of the vehicles followed him as he wound a short distance south on the gravel road, then up a side road called Staffendine Line to the outer edges of Hamlet and Shedden. Finally, he stopped on a gravel lane on a farmer's field sheltered by trees. The No Surrender crew's last road trip had taken them 14 kilometers and lasted perhaps 15 minutes. By now, the sun was up. The Silverado was mired in the mud of a cornfield, but that didn't matter since it wasn't going any further. Taz was supposed to do a U-turn on the gravel road so he could pick up the others, but he appeared to drive far away down the road before he finally turned and came back. We were actually wondering where he was going, why he went so far, M.H. later said. Perhaps it was a jest of God that Goldberg Flans arrived at the meeting in a vehicle that was almost out of gas. Even after meeting with his fellow banditos at a gas station en route to the farm. Perhaps there was something more psychologically complex involved. People who knew Wiener Kellestine couldn't help but wonder if, on some level, the hillbilly Nazi from Iona Station actually wanted to be caught so that he could become truly infamous.
It was an intriguing thought, but a police officer who knew Wiener well dismissed it as the stuff of fiction. For all of his boasting and ranting about history, Wiener had always been truly a stupid man. Why should anyone be surprised that he behaved so stupidly on that defining morning of his life? As the killer snaked through the countryside, Marcelo Arvina worried that he might be shot too, if it took so little for brother to justify killing brother and the banditos. He reasoned that the leaders of the slaughter would want to eliminate all witnesses, and he knew that Mushy, his sponsor into the club, was a man who relied on violence to get what he wanted. So he made a modest request as they rode together. If Arvina couldn't live, he at least wanted a funeral service with an open casket so that his aging mother could see him one last time. Don't shoot me in my face, my pretty face, he said, referencing every beat up prize fighter's favorite joke as he pleaded his case. The day-to-day -day routines of area residents helped put things into a time frame. A woman who worked as a waitress at a local truck stop habitually left her house at 4.45 a.m. and made it a practice to drive slowly down Stafford Line lest she hit any animals. She didn't see any vehicles abandoned by the side of the road that morning, so the caravan must have passed after 5 a.m. A delivery woman for the St. Thomas Times Journal did see four vehicles as she began her route a little after 6 a.m. How fucking far did you guys go, he asked Mather. I thought I told you to take them all the way to the Kitchener area. I was running out of gas in the car, Mather replied. I had to leave them where they were. Kellestine was annoyed and more than a little surprised, but still in control. He ordered Mather and the others to leave their clothes and shoes outside the farmhouse. They entered through his back door barefoot and in their underwear as he stood in his blood-speckled combat jacket. Guns were placed on the table and Kellestine and Sandham made themselves busy stripping them and packing them away. The weapons and shells were placed in cloth and placed in the same green duffel bag that they had come out of a few hours earlier. The dead men's coins, cell phones, and identification documents were already on the coffee table. Kellestine scooped up the money and put it in a mayonnaise jar that held other loose change and sat on a shelf in the living room behind a hand grenade. An artillery shell and CDs by the Beatles, U2, Guns N' Roses, and Vanilla Edge. It was marked potty mouth jar, and the rule in the Kellestine household was that if anyone said a bad word, they had to put a quarter in the jar. The money in the jar went to Kellestine's daughter, Cassie, who had turned seven that Thursday, the day before the killing started. The bloody coins would be a posthumous birthday gift to her from the dead man. Kellestine picked up Crash Kokrias' black and orange Harley Davidson cap and admired it. He would keep it as a souvenir, a $20 trophy with just a dab of blood on it. He spotted a silver pocket knife he liked in the pile on the coffee table and took it for himself as well. Some of the paper money taken from the victims was also smeared with blood. Hey Taz, you need some money to get back with, he offered. Sandham declined, so Kellestine stuffed the cash in a garbage bag along with the dead man's other possessions. Kellestine directed M.H. to drop the bag into a fire pit close to the back door. Somebody had already dragged the couch out from the barn. It clearly had to go since it was soaked in Chopper's blood. Also dropped into the pit were the killer's clothes and the blanket from the barn, which Goldberg, Flans, and Mikey Trotta had used to mop up their friend's blood before they became victims themselves. Sandham was having trouble lighting the fire, even with the can of gasoline to help. He poured the remainder of the gas from the jerry can onto the pile. When he lit it, only one side of the pit ignited, though the flames leapt up at the little biker. Taz, watch out. You're going to set yourself on fire, M.H. shouted. It was apparent that the Winnipeggers' leader still hadn't got his jittery nerves under control. The realization that he had the moral turpitude to murder a friend and a young father, but not the courage to cleanly carry out the deed, must have snuffed out the elation he had expected to feel in the wake of his defining watershed moment. The smell of smoke was heavy in the air when Kellerstein's next-door neighbor, Patrick Timmermans, woke up at 7 that morning. He could see that the smoke was coming from just in front of Kellerstein's barn and thought it had an odd smell like burning garbage. He quickly pulled his window shut to escape the stench. By 7.45, it had been light for almost two hours when Mary and Russell Steele got a call from their friend, Forbes Oldham. He was also a retired farmer who amused himself with crop tours of the area, early morning inspections of his neighbor's fields. This morning, the old farmer was curious about the abandoned cars he had just seen on his friend's property. The Steels left their breakfast table to walk up to the Grand Prix, and they tried to peer through the tinted window. They didn't see anything, but the mere presence of the in their property was suspicious enough. The couple were viewers of the television crime scene series CSI, and therefore were savvy enough not to touch anything, lest they damage the crime scene. Before most people had finished their morning coffee, 
that hastily stashed bodies had already been reported to the police. An Ontario Provincial Police Dispatcher cautioned the patrol officer that the Grey Infinity belonged to Jamie Flans of Kelliswick, who was connected to a man named Robert Bobby Quinn. The dispatcher didn't have anything to say about Flans, but warned that Quinn was described as a repeat criminal offender who sometimes carried a handgun. The officer peered inside the driver's window, which was already rolled down. There, he could see a man in the right rear passenger seat with blood on his face. The man didn't appear to be breathing. Next, the officer noted that the rear hatch of the sport utility vehicle was ajar. He opened it to see a man lying on his right side, also motionless. The officer called the communication center again, this time asking for a backup unit and an ambulance. From the roadside, Mary Steele could now see the outline of Big Paul Sinopoli, but his corpse was so large, she thought it was two people. I could hear the word body, she later recalled. I thought, that's two bodies. A paramedic arrived at 9.05 with lights flashing and sirens wailing, but it was clear there was no need to rush. The bodies remained inside the vehicles as they were towed back to London for further forensic testing, their second grizzly caravan through Wiener Kelstein's neighborhood in a matter of hours. Nina waited all night for Boxer to return home, and when he didn't, she called Wiener Kelstein's farmhouse at 8 a.m., asking if he knew her husband's whereabouts. Wiener said that Boxer had left the farm at 6.30, an answer that was true as far as it went. He neglected to add that his friend had left the farm bloody and lifeless, or that he himself was the murderer. After the phone call, the bikers quickly got down to business. Arvina and Gardner would be elevated from prospect to probationary status, MH later said. Sandham asked Kellestein what he should do with Carlito and Stone, who might still be looking for him in Winnipeg. Well, do them when you get back there, Kellestine said helpfully, as MH later recalled. There was talk among the bikers that Bull Gardner should stay back in Ontario to help Wiener set up his new London chapter of the Banditos. The two men had traveled together with Boxer the previous summer to Sarnia, where they had tried unsuccessfully to set up a Killer Beast support club. It was suggested that Marcelo Arvina might stay behind too, as Kellestine rebuilt the Banditos in Ontario from the ground up. Arvina balked at that idea. He was anxious to get back home to his family, and there was no way he wasn't going to accompany Dwight Mushy, M.H., and Taz Sandham for the 2,000-kilometer ride home. Gardner, Mather, and Kellestine watched them drive off from the kitchen window. The Winnipeg crew were dead silent as they began the drive home, each of them newly wary of the men with whom their fates were now entangled. What was there to say, even if anyone wanted to open up? M.H. pondered his options and calculated what he might achieve by selling out his brothers. Arvina was still shattered by the thought that his friend and sponsor, Mushy, had almost killed him in cold blood. Mushy seethed with scorn for Sandham, who hadn't had the stomach to finish off Goldberg Flans and left the dirty job to him. Taz Sandham had to realize that the others in the car also felt he had wilted under pressure. He was now a mass murderer, and yet the men who knew him best considered him weaker than ever. And what could any of them say about Boxer, laughing in the face of death? They hadn't been on the road long before they heard a radio news bulletin announcing eight bodies had been discovered in vehicles near Tiny Shedding. Not long after that, Taz Sandham pulled over at a Walmart in Barrie, north of Toronto, so that he could buy some water, pop, chips, cheesies, toothpaste, and clothing. Marcelo and Taz didn't have any shoes, having tossed the ones they had in the Kelestine's fire pit. So they bought some plastic beach sandals. Mushy who had luxuriant shoulder-length black hair, also picked up some shampoo. One might have expected him to display an inner fury after his central role in something so huge and so awful. Instead, he seemed very cold and very calm as he studied the toiletries. Perhaps it was what American murder Gary Gilmore once called a calm rage. Whatever the case, personal grooming, not remorse, seemed to be at the top of Big D's mind. Dwight said that head and shoulders was good for removing gunshot residue, M.H. later recalled. Discreet in-store cameras captured Mushy and Arvina in the Walmart from 10.21 until 10.53 a.m., with Mushy always walking in front and neither of them smiling. The others took his advice, lathering up with the shampoo at a truck stop on Highway 11, where $4 would get you a shower and a clean towel. Taz also shaved off his bushy beard and Mushy removed his goatee. They hadn't slept for a day, as the killing and body disposal had taken the entire night. They were drained of adrenaline, but tidy and clean as they climbed back into the blazer. In St. Thomas, it didn't take long for police to realize that they had a biker massacre on their hands. In Chopper Oposo's Volkswagen, they found a printout of the tense email exchange between him and Sandham, dated March 6, 2006. 
Tucked under the seat was Repulso's black leather vest with his fat Mexican crest and Canada rocker on the back. It was in particularly rough shape with one shoulder held together with a giant bobby pin and several patches so brittle they appeared ready to crack. There were two strips of what appeared to be reddish snake skin sewn onto its lapillary. On one front pocket was a crest of a bulldog and on the other were the words, our colors don't run. That afternoon, the Ontario Provincial Police applied for a warrant to search the Kellerstein property. Since Wiener Kellerstein wasn't one of the victims, it was only natural to wonder if he might be one of the killers. In London, an OPP identification officer completed a preliminary check of the bodies of the eight murdered men. They were all Caucasian, and all except Chopper Repulso had apparently died from gunshots to the head. The faces of Chopper, Crash, Boxer, and Goldberg had been covered, as if the killers either couldn't bear to view their handiwork or thought they were showing some form of respect. The person with the most bullets in his body was Bam Bam Salerno, who had bloody patches on the bridge of his nose, right cheek, left ear, right thigh, lower right leg, and right hand. The only victim who was seated behind a steering wheel was Crash Kokrias, so it was only natural to wonder if he somehow thought he was going to be allowed to drive the Volkswagen to safety until the bark of the gun that killed him. For someone who was considered non-violent, Crash had a particularly heavy amount of firepower with seven bullet wounds, including two shots under his left ear, two other shots to the face, and single shots to each of his shoulder, chest, and abdomen. At 7.04 a.m., officers pulled the remains of Boxer Muscadier from the front passenger seat of the Volkswagen. Boxer hadn't yet been identified, and police could only describe him as appearing to be in his 50s, with a bullet wound under his right eye and another in his torso. On the road back to Manitoba, the Winnipeg killer stopped somewhere by a small lake north of Lake Superior for ice cream. Next was an overnight stop at a gas station in the hamlet of Jellicoe, about 80 kilometers west of Longlac a former Northwest Company trading post. They pulled over near the pumps and slept in the blazer. When the sun came up a few hours later, Taz Sandham knocked on the door of the gas station's owner, who came out and filled up the tank. By the time they reached the Nesso station just inside the Manitoba border, Taz and Mushy were nervous that the blazer might somehow be bugged with the police recording device. Everyone got out of it for a few minutes while they calmed themselves down, but an absence of listening devices didn't mean the police weren't wondering what the Winnipeggers were doing. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police would soon be asking about Mushy's whereabouts. He'd been charged with conspiracy to produce methamphetamine and one of the conditions of his bail was that he notified police whenever he left Manitoba. Before he made the drive back to Wiener Kellestine's farm, Mushy had told the RCMP that he was going to Ontario and he had phoned them again the day before the murders. The Mounties in Manitoba knew Mushy was the secretary treasurer of Taz Sandham's Bandidos chapter and their point man in drug trafficking. It would be natural for them to wonder what he knew about the massacre of his clubmates. The best strategy for Mushy was to say that he had left the province on Friday before the shooting started. The press quickly called the Shed and Slaughter the worst biker massacre in the history of the world, even though there wasn't a Harley Davidson in sight. Naturally, the Hells Angels were blamed, and just as naturally, they scoffed at the suggestion. Donnie Peterson, the Hells Angels Central Canada Region Secretary and Ontario spokesman, was asked by the Toronto Star that Saturday morning about the murders. He said he wasn't surprised that many people were quickly jumping to the conclusion that the killing must somehow be the Angels doing. Any society needs a boogeyman, he said. Peterson, a former boxer who ran a successful Toronto area motorcycle shop and had no criminal record, sloughed off the suggestion that the Hells Angels might have slaughtered the Bandidos as part of a drug turf skirmish. One of the reasons we, Hells Angels and Bandidos, don't travel in the same social circles is that we don't have two nickels to rub together, Peterson said. We're not taking anything. There's nothing to take. Peterson also dismissed media speculation that the killers might have been attempting to curry favor with the Hells Angels to become members of themselves. None of them had any prospect of being a Hells Angel, Peterson said. Certainly, there were no overtures from this side. We never approached people to become members. People approach us. The massacre was big news around the world. From People's Daily Online, the official internet voice of the government of Communist China, to the Sydney Morning Herald in Australia, the Irish Examiner, the Times of London, Newsday on Long Island, and major American television networks, including Fox and CNN. Small airplanes buzzed low over the infinity so that news photographers could catch photos of Big Paul his mammoth gut hanging out and his body curled up like that of a giant baby.
Mary Thompson learned of the deaths of Goldberg Flans and Big Paul Sinopoli from a newspaper story. She had been afraid of the banditos as a gang, but Big Paul and Goldberg were always nice and even protective towards her. Just a few days before his murder, Big Paul seemed apologetic that he had borrowed a little money from her and promised to pay it back soon. Sergeant Gordon McDowell of the Durham Regional Police Surveillance Team woke up that Saturday morning to news that the massacre had happened, almost under their noses. I was shocked, he later said. Disbelief, not fear, was the reaction of Kellestine's neighbors. Before the carnage, Tiny Shedden had been known best for its annual rhubarb festival. None of the eight victims were from the area, but now newspapers and broadcasters were referring to the slaughter as the Shedden Massacre, which seemed a little unfair. As Marty Argent, owner of the Holland House restaurant, said, they were all strangers to us. When Ripper Fulliger heard the names of the victims, he quickly noted that Boxer Muscadier had been murdered, but not his longtime friend, Wiener Kellestein. The two men had been together for decades, and it was suspicious that Kellestein was still alive. I bet you we fucking did it, Ripper said to Glenn Atkinson.